Thank you for being here today and for waiting so patiently. Um, I wanted to talk to you about some proposed changes in legislation uh, that I believe are, uh, are very bad and send our state into uh, retrograde for years to come. Joining me on stage are uh, Aaron Runyon and uh, Dr. Henry Nicholas. And I think, you, I think you know who these folks are and they're gonna be speaking a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Um, as crime victims' rights leaders and law enforcement prof professionals, uh, we found it necessary to draw your attention to pr these proposed changes in the current laws that would deliver dramatic and negative impacts to firearm sentencing enhancements, mandatory bail schedules, and sex offender registration. Orange County's been the leader in several public safety reforms from Jessica's Law to Proposition 115 to Marcy's Law. I know that, uh, that with your help, we can band together, have our voices heard, and affect change once again. Many of you here today have already been briefed at length on these, uh, on these matters, so, uh, all right. I have it written down here that I'll keep my remarks short, but uh, I, need to, I need to let you know that they're not really that short, uh, because I was kind of looking at it. Uh, but the first thing is, uh, use a gun and you're done, uh, SB, SB 620. So, and I think you kind of know where we are already, at, you know, in the, in the law now, but uh, the 1020 life, use a gun and you're done law, Penal Code Section 12022.53 was uh, enacted in 1997 because Californians wanted to prevent gun violence and to reduce the number of repeat offenders. The 1020 life law provides an enhancement to California state prison sentences for certain serious felonies, including murder, kidnapping, robbery, carjacking, rape, uh, and in those kind of cases when the uh, perpetrator uses a gun during the commission of a crime. In addition to and consecutive to the sentence for the underlying felony conviction, an enhancement adds 10 years, uh, it, uh, to 10 years to the prison sentence if a person possesses a gun while committing the serious crime. If he fires the weapon uh, during the commission of that crime, it adds 20 years. And if he kills or seriously injures somebody during the commission of that crime, it adds a, a, another sentence of 25 years to life in prison consecutive to the, whatever the sentence is that the person would otherwise be receiving. So in my experiences, both as a judge and a prosecutor, I found that the 1020 to life, use the gun and you're done law, it's been simple and effective. I, and it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, let's lock away the criminals who are committing the most serious crimes and uh, using guns in, their, in, these, uh, in these offenses. We also have another gun enhancement uh, law which adds uh, uh, to, which states any person using a firearm during the commission of any felony, not just the serious and violent felonies, but during the commission of any felony, shall be punished by an additional and consecutive term in prison for three, four, or 10 years. And, the, and it also states, and by the way, this applies to both laws, the court shall not strike an allegation under this section or a finding bringing a person within the provisions of this section. So it prohibits the court, the judges, from, from striking the uh, gun enhancement allegations. SB 620 would allow the judge or allow a judge at the time of sentencing or recent at the time of sentencing to unilaterally strike or dismiss these uh, firearm sentencing enhancements. In other words, the enhancements that I know that the people of Orange County want uh, would really become a suggestion, not, uh, not mandatory, not a mandate. This law would hurt our fight against gangs especially. Using a gun should have severe consequences, no question about it. SB 10, a second piece of backwards legislation currently under consideration is SB 10. Uh, this would eliminate the existing bail system and replace it uh, with a pretrial release system. Today, when somebody's arrested for a felony, there's a bail schedule in place, which is established by the courts and is based on the seriousness of the offense and is designed to ensure that the offender will return to court. If charges are filed, the defendant will be brought to court within 48 hours of arrest for a bail hearing. At the hearing, a judge decides the appropriate bail to set based on several factors that include protection of the public, seriousness of the charge offense, 
and in considering seriousness of the charge offense, the, the judge is to consider uh, um, the injuries, use of weapons, firearms, threats to witnesses, victims, um, and uh, use or possession of controlled substances. All of those are parts of the consideration. Also, any cr uh, previous criminal record of the defendant. And um, very importantly, the probability of his or her appearing at trial or hearing. The current system relies on the defendants to appear in court as they provided financial collateral to ensure uh, that they would appear in court. Under current law, these standards can't be reduced for serious or violent felonies without the court making a finding of unusual circumstances on the record and justifying the reduction. SB 10 would eliminate the current system of, of, uh, of presumed bail in felony cases in favor of pretrial release meaning that all but the most serious offenders would be released back into the community to await their court appearance without the financial assurance of posting bail. This action would take place before the, before the DA has even received the, the police reports or even had a chance to file a case. All offenders would undergo a risk assessment within hours of the arrest and the determination of pretrial release would be made before the prosecution is even informed of the arrest on many occasions. The most serious offenders would be entitled to the same risk assessment and subject to release conditions, uh, and these conditions would be recommended to a judge within 48 hours of the arrest. Bail would be reserved for only those cases in which a judge, in which a judge determines that the conditions for release would not ensure that the defendants return to court or, or when there's a doubt as to the safety of the victim or the, or the public. It's, 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 an, it's an incredible idea that, that first the court is to look at whether or not um, there are conditions, whether or not there's a pretrial release condition uh, that will ensure the safety of the public or will ensure that the person will return to court. And it's only if the judge determines that the, that that that's not possible, that there's no pretrial release condition that will ensure the person returns to court or the public safety, then the judge is to uh, have the person post monetary bail. And the monetary bail that the judge is required to have the person or is allowed to have the person post is completely useless. It's, 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 uh, it's just so anemic, it's, it's ridiculous. Rather than imposing bail that's, that's tied to the to the offense, the seriousness of the offense, and and uh, and so forth, the, the judge is to re, is re, would be required to uh, set bail at amount at an amount that the defendant can afford um, uh, rather comfortably, an amount that he that the defendant can afford without uh, without getting a loan, without uh, needing to go to other people, or without getting collateral to uh, uh, to get the bail money, and uh, and then even then. Once the, once the judge sets that bail, uh, there's no bond. There's no, you know, the whole, the whole concept of bail bonds is gone out the window. Uh, so at that point, um, the court uh, would set the bail amount and then allow the defendant to, instead of bond, post 10% of the uh, bail amount that's set, and that's, and that's called a, a bond under this, uh, under this new legislation. If the defendant doesn't return uh, for his next scheduled appearance, then he just then he owes the court the remaining 90 percent, and uh, that goes in as a uh, like a judgment or a debt uh, to the court, as opposed to a bond that would that could be uh, uh, collected upon. Uh, so SB 10 essentially eliminates bondsmen. Uh, presently, uh, if you think about a bail bondsman, if you have a bail bondsman. The bondsman has authority to deliver his or her client to court to ensure his appearance. If the defendant jumps bail, then the bail bondsman has six months to make his or her client appear uh, before forfeiting the bond, which is a very significant motivator. So say that there's a bond up for $100,000 or, or 50 or 80,000, whatever it is, um, if, the, if the bail bondsman um, doesn't have the person appear in court, then the bail bondsman is subject to lose that 
that money. So there's a big motivator uh, for the bail bondsman to uh, uh, get the person to appear in court. <clears throat> Here there's no incentive to deliver an at-large defendant to court. No one uh, under the new uh, legislation would, be, uh, would go out looking for the suspect. A uh, warrant would be issued for his arrest. It would be tossed into a huge pile with a lot of other warrants uh, that are issued as a result of this bad le legislation without any increase to the resources or actually uh, uh, any resources or personnel or whatever might be needed uh, to go out and, uh, and uh, catch the fugitives. So only in the rarest of cases, such as a capital case, for example, would the court have the authority to detain somebody pretrial without setting bail. And then even in that case, that becomes a, a difficult case because then uh, the, in order to retain or to detain somebody in such a case, the prosecutor then has to uh, file a petition with the court and uh, the defendant then is entitled to a hearing where um, he can bring witnesses and uh, cross-examine uh, witnesses against him and so on and so forth. He, the defendant could, could actually require the victims to uh, come to court so he can examine them. Of course, this flies in the face of uh, other um, protections that we've had for victims over the years. Uh, Prop 115 that I co-authored uh, back in, uh, oh, I think 1990 uh, or, or so, uh, was uh, one of the major reasons for it was to, was to protect victims from being, uh, uh, from being harassed in court and having to testify over and over again. This bill would generate a lot of new costs and, and uh, but without giving any kind of a of a funding stream for those costs, um, so that they would all be taxpayers' expense. So, for example, uh, the risk assessment, the uh, the pretrial release hearing, the detention hearing, the related costs of any conditions that would include might include monitoring or any other such things. All of that has a cost, and none of it is covered uh, in this uh, legislation. And then and and. I think a, an outstanding or even a stunning cost uh, of SB 10 is that uh, when the court, uh, when a person comes to court, any person who doesn't have counsel at the court, uh, the judge is required to offer to appoint counsel at, at, at taxpayer expense. And the, uh, the need for indig indigency or the, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of indig ind indigency, excuse me, is out the window. Uh, the court uh, would be required to appoint or offer to appoint counsel for anyone. Rich, poor, doesn't make any difference. Uh, so, so that's SB 10. It's, uh, um, I, I, it's really a, a, a poor law, if you ask me. Um, so then, then there's SB 421, uh, which is the, uh, uh, it's going to the, Assembly Public Safety Committee tomorrow, uh, but that's about the uh, registrate the sexual uh, sexual offender sexual offender registration, and so California currently requires most sexual offenders to register with law enforcement for life, uh, with their information posted on the <clears throat> on the uh, public Megan's Law website. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, but under the new proposal, the offenders would register, it would be a three, a tiered proposal. They would regi register for 10 years, 20 years, or life, depending on the nat nature of the crime and the offender's background. And so uh, we're deeply concerned about the impact that 421 would have on the public's ability to know who's living next door. Uh, for example, seven-year-old Megan Kanka was murdered in 1994 by a sexual predator who had previously molested girls in 1979 and 1981. Fourteen years later, Megan's parents were unaware that the sexual predator had moved into their neighborhood. And, uh, and, and, and that's what happened there. So that's why we have, uh, that's why we have Megan's Law. Um, you know, it's exactly for this kind of a situation. And, uh, uh, that was you can see that was more than uh, um, than the than the time for the uh, for the registration. So for this current idea for 421 is bad because uh, it'll cause too many dangerous offenders to be monitored for too short a period. Uh, it'll be exceptionally burdensome on law enforcement and prosecutors, not to mention very costly to administer, and would increase the burden on taxpayers. Under this new tiered system, an offender who commits a violent uh, offense, such as rape, child molestation, or assault with intent to commit a sex offense, would be classified as a tier two offender 
and would not be required to register for life. Repeat misdemeanor offenders and felony sexual offenders such as recidivist offenders who commit multiple acts of child annoyance or possess any amount of child pornography will only be required to register as a tier one offender uh, for 10 years. So a guy who possessed 200,000 graphic images of babies sexually tortured would not be required to register after 10 years. The proposed threshold allowing offenders to be removed from the sex registry is too low and the burden on the prosecution to keep offenders on the sex registry would be almost impossible to achieve. For example, in order to be removed from the sex registry uh, uh, post uh, SB 421, offenders would merely need to show uh, that they're currently registered, they have no pending charges which might extend their minimum period of registration, and they're not currently in custody or on probation or parole or mandatory supervision. So you have those requirements, but it's really important to realize that SB 421 does not even require offenders seeking to be relieved from the, regist from the registration uh, to be crime free during that time period, just certain, certain crimes. In contrast with this low standard, the prosecution would only, would only need to be able to keep an offender on the registry by doing the following. After the offender petitions to be removed from the registry, the prosecution must request a hearing and provide proof that public safety would be significantly enhanced by continuing registration, a vague and uh, almost impossible standard to, uh, uh, to figure out. As we've seen in the years following Prop 36 and 47, enacting retroactive legislation like that that provides offenders with a poorly defined avenue for relief will lead to a lot of costly litigation and it'll be overly burdensome on our prosecutors and courts which are already stretched thin. Don't we want to use our resources to put away new offenders preying on our children? The people won't be given the benefit of their bargain uh, if uh, Prop 421 goes into effect. Many offenders who have pleaded guilty over the last 30 years have also pleaded to offenses uh, which under SB 421 would not require lifetime registration. In addition, with the passage of 421, defendants would be granted the ability to petition for removal from the registry in their county of residence and, would, and that would remove the requirement uh, to petition for removal in their county of conviction. Well, um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot about this and it's, and it's a little bit, it's a kind of a complicated uh, um, uh, set of uh, laws, but, uh, but some, of the, some of the standards uh, get, to be, uh, get to be pretty crazy. And when you start thinking about who would be determined to be a low, uh, low risk offender, low to moderate risk offender, and would be allowed to get in the lower tiers of the uh, registration, uh, you know, it, it, it comes a little bit closer to home. So, for example, uh, McGill Calderon, 75 years old now, convicted of multiple counts of child molestation that required him to register as a sex offender, uh, and he failed to register in 1985 and 97 and 2008. Um, uh, he would be almost automatically relieved of his need to register since his uh, um, conviction predates 1987. And uh, this uh, provision, or this law has provisions that if the conviction predates 1987, then, uh, uh, then the person can be removed from the registry just by the attorney general uh, making the decision, not even notifying the prosecutor or, or any other people. Tung Lee, 53, and Bo Pham, 56, both committed multiple forced sex crimes, including rape, kidnapping, and oral copulation by force against seven victims. Although these crimes were committed against multiple victims over multiple dates, they were, they were all tried together. And so under these uh, 4, 421, it's all just considered one incident, uh, which, is, uh, which is, of course, crazy. So you've heard about these uh, standard risk assessment tools that evaluate a person's risk. Um, so some of the experts have determined and based on this standard risk assessment tool, uh, that a couple of these folks are low risk. And let me give you an example here. Jeffrey Adam Tracy is currently serving a sentence of 10 years and eight months in a state prison for sexually assaulting an autistic boy 
and using his victim to produce child pornography. Tracy was found guilty of orally copulating his victim, committing lewd acts upon his victim, uh, videotaping some of the sex acts, which he then emailed to various individuals. His special needs victim was under five years old when Tracy committed these disgusting crimes against the victim. Tracy actually told police during his confession that he chose his victim because the child's condition made him unable to communicate the crime. He told law enforcement that he won't stop molesting if he's not incarcerated. The standard risk assessment tool considers him to be, you guessed it, low risk. And there were others. I won't go through, I won't, I won't just continue to go through these various uh, uh, examples, but there really are quite a number of examples that if you look at it, just common sense tells you this is not a low risk individual and he's put low risk or maybe low to moderate risk and would be able to get to the lower tier of, of uh, registration. To talk more about the impact of this legislation would have on that this legislation would have on victims, I'd like to introduce Dr. Henry Nicholas III, chief architect of Marcy's Law, which is named after his uh, sister who was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, Dr. Nicholas. I'll step in. Thank you, uh, District Attorney Rakakis, for inviting me to partic participate in this important press conference today. Um, I also want to thank uh, Aaron Runyon here today for your leadership in victims' rights and uh, for your assistance in helping to overturn these, uh, these three uh, disastrous pieces of legislation. Um, I'm speaking to you today not only as a victim myself, having had to cope with the violent murder of my young sister, Marcy, but also as the founder and chairman of Marcy's Law for All, a national organization that has now successfully advocated for the passage of constitutional amendments, elevating the rights of victims of crime into five state constitutions. The first of which, of course, was here in California in 2008. We are talking about basic rights, fundamental rights, such as the right to be notified, the right to be present, and the right to speak at key moments in the process. We're here today to talk about three pieces of legislation currently advancing in the state capitol, each of which would be terrible public policy as currently written. Each of them, in their own way, would make the already difficult role of being a victim in this criminal justice process even more difficult. Each of these bills, without appropriate amendments, should be voted down by any legislator who believes that victims should be treated with dignity and respect. First, let's uh, address SB 620. Well, if you're using a gun in the commission of a crime, then you're by definition a violent criminal. We should not be sending the message to those convicted of violent crimes that a criminal in the justice system will be anything other than strict with them. We lose an important deterrent to violent crime when we advance legislation that could lead to less prison time for any violent criminal. SB 10. Under the current bail system, the potential pretrial release of someone charged with a crime takes place at an arraignment hearing. With the passage of Marcy's Law in 2008, a victim of crime in California has the constitutional right to be present and make statements statements to the judge at the arraignment hearing, including asking for certain release conditions, such as a restraining order. Under this legislation, in case of all misdemeanors and most felonies, the release decision and conditions will be set through a non-public administrative process in which the victim has no right to be informed, let alone be present or heard. In fact, nowhere in this legislation is a requirement or a process set out that would afford the victim any opportunity to provide any input whatsoever before someone is charged with a crime and released. That means that this is either undermining Marcy's law or it's unconstitutional. And should this be approved, this law, should it be passed, we would intend to move forward vigorously to see that this law is found unconstitutional and would never go into effect. Uh, SB 421. Uh, District Attorney Rakakis brought up a number of concerns that he has with this legislation. From my perspective, there are three issues that I would like to highlight in this bill that are troublesome from a victim's rights perspective. Under this legislation, 
it becomes unclear whether or not the victim of a, of, of a sex crime has placed a convict on the registry, will be informed of that change, and will be informed when a change in status is possible. Um, victims have the constitutional right to be informed of any change in status once, once the criminal has been found guilty. Uh, this would arguably, once again, be unconstitutional under Marcy's law. Additionally, it would appear that in order for a victim to have a voice in the process, which is guaranteed constitutionally here in California, if they did not find out about it, that victim would have to travel to, whatever, to wherever the convicted sex offender has established residence, rather than requiring that this sort of hearing take place in the area where the crime took place. That would be uh, much more convenient and um, you know, satisfactory for, uh, for the victim. And of course, we have to worry about future victims of crime when they are no, no longer able to discern when someone who has been convicted of a sex crime chooses to move into their neighborhood. In closing, in a time when nationally more and more attention is being paid to the rights of victims of crime, it's alarming that these bills as written will be getting serious consideration by public policymakers. I would encourage our state legislatures to re-examine these bills from the perspective of victims, something that it would appear has not been done. Without changes, I urge that all three of these bills be voted down. Thank you, Dr. Nick. So uh, here with us today also to uh, talk about the impact on victims is Aaron Runyon, uh, founder of the Joyful Child Foundation. And, um, and of course, you know uh, who Erin Runyon is, her, her lovely daughter, um, Samantha, that just a few days before her sixth birthday was, uh, uh, was kidnapped and, and uh, horribly murdered. And Erin is uh, here to share some thoughts with us. Aaron. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I am here to speak about SB 421 in particular because it will decimate California's sex offender registry. It's estimated that within the first, as soon as it is passed, 10 to 11,000 registered sex offenders will immediately be dismissed from the registry. At that same moment, upwards of 45,000 registered sex offenders will immediately be able to appeal their registration status. All offenders will have the right to appeal their status as a tier one, tier two, and tier three, and then their registration status. Every single offender, regardless of what their crime was. The first provision alone, blanketly releasing every offender, regardless of their crime, who committed it before the year 1987, is outrageous. If you can imagine your child being sexually assaulted and growing up with PTSD and all of the trauma, they come out on the other end knowing that at least this person is going to be tracked. Somebody's going to be making sure that they are not a danger, that they are not going to come after your child, your family, much less another child. And suddenly that is taken away at the whim of the legislature, at the whim of a blanket law. I will concede that the California sex, sex Offender Registry needs some improvement, that not every offense needs to be registrable for an entire lifetime. I will agree to that. But to make it this blanket appeals process is ludicrous. It is dangerous to the public, it is cruel to their victims, and it will cost the state tens of millions of dollars. There is no process like this in this country where you're suddenly going to have 120,000 appeals from one category of offender. It's going to cost our state a fortune and that's just in the appeal, appellate process, not to mention what crimes are committed thereafter. It's estimated that fewer than 10% of all sexual assaults in this country result in an arrest, much less a conviction. It is the least we can do to keep track of the few offenders we have caught and honor those victims. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Dr. Nick. Um, you know, Orange, Orange County has been 
um, a place where, where we've uh, started uh, a great deal of reform. And, uh, uh, you know, here we are now, and, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to work on this. We need to make sure that, uh, uh, that, these, things, that these things don't happen. And uh, so we want to uh, let people know that in order to ensure that, uh, that, these, that these bills don't go through, uh, we need to pay some attention. People need to contract, uh, contact their, uh, their elected representatives. Uh, and uh, we're, sending, we're going to be sending a letter to the governor that, um, uh, com that com basically complains and asks him uh, you know, to, to consider and not sign this kind of this, this legislation if it, if it gets there. And, uh, and if people want to add their signature to that letter, uh, we have a uh, we would we have a website or a uh, um, an email address uh, to have them uh, to have them send it. I don't know if it's up here, but it's Michelle Vanderlinden at da.ocgov.com, and uh, and of course that that's available. So this concludes our prepared comments, and uh, we'll take any uh, questions or a few questions if anybody has any at this time. Yes, sir. Perhaps an oversimplification, but would it be fair to say, in looking at these three, you view it as a way that the state would release more dangerous criminals? Is that kind of an umbrella idea here? Well, that that's absolutely correct. I mean, you know that uh, uh, that that that's what's happening. I mean, this is uh, this is a part of of uh, of a, uh, a a general assault on the criminal justice system that's taking place right now. And, uh, and it's uh, uh, pushing towards uh, 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 more lenient uh, sentencing and more lenient treatment of criminals. And so that's what, uh, that's what this is a part of. And, uh, and it, of course, uh, uh, many, many dangerous criminals would be, uh, would be released or would be left on the street uh, based on this. And, uh, and, I, and I, I mean, I, I can only uh, say that uh, it gets pretty clear to me that uh, um, that this that this sort of thing won't be if it goes into law, it won't be reversed until a lot of new people or a lot of new innocent people are victimized by it. And can you talk about what you saw the last time the state did something with AB 109? Well, I can tell you that that, uh, that this goes back um, farther than that. I mean, this uh, um, you know, if going back to. Uh, uh, to the to the 1970s, we had uh, we had prison overcrowding in the 1970s, and and uh, in order to reduce uh, prison overcrowding, there was com there was a complete change in in sentencing, and uh, we went from uh, indeterminate to determinate sentences, and thousands of people were left out of, were let out of prison, and it was for the very same reason that AB 109 was enacted um, many years later. By the way, by the same by the same uh, governor who happened to be. Uh, governor at the time in the in the 70s, but uh, once that happened, uh, with thousands of, uh, of people released from prison, uh, crime was on the upswing and it continued to go up. And we probably spent the next uh, 15 years getting some of those people back in prison. Uh, only they had committed new crimes against new victims, and uh, uh, and then in the uh, you know we come to uh, uh, 2000. Five, six, whenever there was started to get to be a lot of pressure based on prison overcrowding, it was the same. It's the same thing again. Uh, the solution was a little bit different, but I mean, essentially not different because essentially the solution was uh, to get people out of prison, just to reduce the population by pushing them out of prison. And uh, so, uh, AB 109 did that. It uh, did. It did uh, realignment, push people out of prison, um, uh, caused the uh, counties to be responsible for. Um, for a great deal more, and the state to be responsible for a great deal less, and uh, uh, so we have a lot of uh, people who uh, should be in prison on the street. And by the way, it's not just AB 109; uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's Prop 47 as well, and uh, it's it's a continuous process. So it, the way it appears right now is that uh, um, that there there's no end to this. It just it has to end by uh, by the people realizing that this is the wrong way to go and uh, we have to stop it and start pushing back the other way. Are there any adjustments or concessions to any of the bills that would in turn uh, allow you to support 
Well, S SB, SB 421, uh, the, uh, re the registration, uh, sec uh, sex offender registration, um, is a uh, is some legislation, and and like uh, Aaron mentioned, um, it you know having everybody register for life is probably uh, shouldn't have to be required, and uh, there might be some reasonable changes uh, to uh, to the to the registration, the, the uh, sexual offender registration, uh, that could be made that could uh, you know that could reduce that registration period uh, for some people, but the way this is written right now. It's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't, there's a lot of things it doesn't consider. We have been in, con my office has been in contact with the um, uh, people who are um, uh, proposing it and supporting it and so forth to, uh, uh, to discuss those things and, and, uh, and there might be some concessions and we're hoping to gain those concessions and, and, uh, and have that law be uh, uh, done in, in some more reasonable way. And so, what are the pardon me. What are the well, there's a few of them. Like, for example, um, it's. Uh, uh, I, I think it's. I think it's not right that uh, somebody who's a uh, um, a possessor of child pornography uh, is uh, would would be on the on the first tier. And when you think about when you think about child pornography, that's a very serious matter because uh, every image of uh, of uh, sexual exploitation of a child is uh, based on a crime. I mean, it's a crime to do the thing that those people are taking pictures of. And we have people who are uh, have been convicted of uh, possession of of uh, multiple amounts of of child pornography. And uh, and they, and they would be uh, they would be on the on tier one, and uh, uh, we've talked about that, and uh, we're um, um, pushing that uh, to to change that from 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 tier one to uh, to a higher tier, and so um, there are uh, individual things like that that uh, uh, that we're working on. May I make a point to that? Absolutely. Um, there's so much misinformation about what the public, what the sex offender registry is in California that I think an important point to be made is that this bill impacts both the private law enforcement registry as well as the public registry. So what we're, what this bill does is it makes it impossible for law enforcement to know when they are investigating a new sex crime, perhaps, whether or not this person has already served time and it was in fact a registered sex offender. That record goes away. So that in and of itself I think is extremely dangerous and a concession point. There's, there are many laws, many perhaps misdemeanors that need not be on the public registry um, or maybe not after 10 years. You know, that can be a reasonable adjustment. But when it comes to also eliminating from the, criminal, from the crime database for law enforcement, that's dangerous. It's going to make it so that they don't look further when chances are there are crimes that they need to look into further. Also, uh, uh, SB 421 is going to be heard uh, tomorrow in the uh, um, Public Safety Committee of the of the Senate, and I believe you're going to Aaron Runyon is going to be there to uh, testify and and uh, make some of those uh, make some of those arguments. So, so is SB 10. Didn't hear that. So is SB 10. Both of those bills will be heard by the Public Safety. Great. You can't argue S SB 10, can Will you? Will do. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate your time and, and uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you.